Welcome to The Teacher's Story. I'm Jackie Scully. This is a podcast to elevate teacher voice. In this program, you will hear teachers sharing their journey into this profession and their ideas for education. I'm kicking it off Teacher Appreciation Week, which starts May 2nd. This is about honest, vulnerable, inspiring storytelling. It's a time and a space for teachers to share their ideas for the future of education. Teachers are beautiful beings who give their heart and soul to their community. They're innovators, they're inspirational, not only to children, but to the people around them. And they deserve to share their voice. So welcome to The Teacher's Story, enjoy. Hi, welcome to The Teacher's Story. I'm Jackie Scully, and today we have Kevin Foote with us. And I connected with Kevin on LinkedIn, and he has quite a story and a really interesting career today that I'm going to dive into later in the conversation. Uh, Kevin's a former instructional leader and elementary school teacher, and now is an educational design specialist for K-12. And the whole uh, company is about creating better classrooms, learning environments to stimulate and engage children. And I think the layout of classrooms and furniture and design is definitely part of the learning experience. So I'm excited to learn more about your current position as well today. So thank you, Kevin. No, thank you for having me. I'm super excited. So thank you. So my first question for you is, what was your inspiration to get into teaching? Awesome. Well, I, I think this is a pretty common answer, so I'm not going to be too original. It's usually a, um, you know, a strong teacher and influence in your life that um, guided you there. And mine is the same. Um, I was in fourth grade, and I had a teacher's name was uh, Richard Hogan. He's actually um, he's at Arizona State University now as a professor. He retired, and then went back and did that we still kind of follow each other and talk and everything. And I went to his retirement party too. And I had um, uh, got to talk to him and I showed him an article that was in the newspaper. Uh, I had, I got interviewed at my college graduation and it was um, somebody was going around and this was at Northern Arizona university. We were all kind of waiting in the stands of the football field there. And they came by and asked us questions and, a reporter just stopped me and said, Hey, you know, what are you graduating with? I said, Oh, college of education and, and so on and so forth. And they said, Oh, why did you want to become a teacher? And I said, I had an amazing fourth grade teacher and I wanted to, you know, be just like him and they printed it. And so I framed it and gave it to him. He still has that and everything. So um, it's, it it was really him that, uh, that was a positive influence on my life and education. And um, it was a really rough time for me. So he helped me guide through that, um, not just educationally, but uh, personally as well. Yeah, I love that story. And especially as it comes full circle and he has this, uh, you know, article still framed. And I like the last point you said is that it's not necessarily just the content that a teacher teaches you, but what they share with you and how they inspire you as a mentor And I Mm -hmm. think a lot of times it's from those formative years in elementary school and you went into elementary education. I was originally going to go into that. And then I found it to be completely overwhelming. (laughs) I was like (laughs) certified in like six grades and all these subjects. And it's, I give it up to elementary school teachers. The prep work to get that certification is intense. And then you could teach any number of grade levels and subjects mm-hmm. like throughout the course of your your time teaching so it is it's a big load and I don't think a lot of people realize that they think that it's more so when you're high school or even college I'm like no actually the elementary school teachers have a lot <laughs> on their plate um yeah I love this story and is that's kind of why you wanted to go into elementary education as well yeah I just I really I like those ages um I did, but I tell you, I did not want to go any lower than like third or fourth grade. Okay. Um, and I, I just, I, I don't know, that really wasn't my thing to do it to. So I totally get that. But I'll tell you this, Jackie, I talked to a lot of teachers that, you know, when we would get together for district meetings and they would say those same things, the high school teams would come in and we were all sitting down doing PD and workshops and what have you. And they would say, oh my gosh, I can never do your job. Like I can't work with babies you know they would say that on every single elementary teacher says there's no way you could get me to teach high school 
So, oh yeah. yeah. So trust me, we know the exact same thing. Like we feel the exact same way was like, I don't want 180 kids. I yes. don't want to grade all those papers. Yeah, I don't want to deal true. with like, I don't want to deal with 17 year olds. Like, so mm-hmm. it, trust me, it, I think it does go both ways. And it really is like your personality um, that, that make that gets you there. Oh, absolutely. Like it's the type of person you are that matches. Like I yeah. get it all the time from friends, like not in the teaching field that like, how do you spend time with teenagers and try to teach them all day long? I'm like, I don't know. I must be a crazy person. I have no right? idea, but I find them to be hilarious. And, you know, there's something about going through kind of their, you know, big growth transition in life. Like I teach mostly upperclassmen. So it's like 11th, yeah. 12th grade. I love seeing them getting ready for like becoming a young adult. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. Process. I taught middle school before. Mm. Those are some special teachers. <laughs> So, the, okay, so th- to kind of wrap that story up, yeah. um, both high school and then elementary will say, like, like I, there's no way I could teach first graders, like, how to read. And then a first grade teacher is like, there's no way I'm teaching almost grown adults. And then everybody says, none of us want to teach middle school. <laughs> <laughs> I and know, the, all the time. And then there's the middle school teachers in which I finished my last my last five years was six, uh, was middle school, sixth grade. And, and, and you look at, and we were all the crazy ones. We were all the ones who weren't afraid mm-hmm. of anything. Like, yeah, yeah. It was, it was just funny how all of them go, yeah, none of us want to do six through eight. None of us. Usually it's the middle school teachers that plan the happy hours. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> we need, we need to get together and vent about everything. Right. They're very yeah. social. They're the ones who like, you don't mess with because, right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we got our stuff together. That's so yeah. funny. Yeah. Um, in your early years teaching, do you have like any uh fun stories or challenges or any takeaways that you want to share from those first years or any? Oh man, story? so many. Like, uh, and I have so many of my friends are like, "Why did you not write a book about it?" Mm. And I feel like I wanted to write a book and just get every teacher story of. Give me like a, a two minute funny story or a two minute inspirational one. And I'm sure those are, they are out there, but, um, oh man, so many. So I, I think of, I'll give you kind of my first year of teaching. And I was in a, um, I got assigned to a third grade classroom for student teaching. And um, I had asked to be at a certain school and I didn't get it because it, my niece had gone there. So legally, like our college, you can't have family members. So I got assigned to a school I'd never heard of with somebody I'd never met. Went and interviewed with them and everything. Got placed in their class to do student teaching in third grade. Um, uh, did a pretty good job. So they they basically offered me a position at the school because it, it was a growing campus. And they're like, we need another third grade teacher. And if you want it, it's yours kind of thing. And it was pretty funny because they're like, yeah, you have to interview for it. So we did an interview and it was the funniest thing ever. Like I got interviewed with the principal and all the teachers, even knowing that, <laughs> knowing that I was getting the job. But I was like, I wonder if I should just answer these just crazy and see what happens. <laughs> I just think like, like <laughs> no, the I worst got the job. like interview questions. Yeah. Worst interview yeah. So I would say my first year of teaching, um, uh, I have so many stories, highs, lows, challenges, um, and I think back in the school I was at, what they would do is the second grade teachers would place the students in the third grade teachers' classrooms, and this was based off of a few things. The main thing was like um, a parent request, and so we call these things pinks and blues, you know, mm-hmm. uh, pinks were the girls, blues were the boys, and we would lay them all out. And so I learned it after doing third grade, we would place kids with fourth grade teachers based on, oh, like, you know, that teacher's really, really strong and blank. I think the student would go there. You know what? They may clash or these students cannot be in the same room. Don't put them together kind of thing. And because I was new, I had no parent requests, really. Um, And I think the second grade teachers were just like, let's see what happens. And I got, I mean, just like, the Island of Misfit Toys class. And, <laughs> and uh, at the end of the year, I called it my Dr. Phil class because I had oh my gosh. I had four kids go through divorce. I had one kid diagnosed with type 1 diabetes 
Um, and the mom would just, her and I would talk almost every day. Cause like his grades started falling off. He was, you know, just completely lethargic. He couldn't control his, um, bathroom, you know, like he, he couldn't control his, um, his bladder. And finally she took it. He had like a well over 700 blood sugar count mm. and he was, yeah. And so we had, he was in the hospital. Then I had a student who was, um, trying to hide from her real mom and, mm. and all of this for a first year teacher in their twenties. And I was like, what wow. is going on? But it, it, it was that moment where I decided like either you, either you quit and this isn't for you or you power through this, you do your best you can with what you have and you get these students ready for fourth grade and you help out with, with all these different challenges in your classroom and <clears throat> even personally. And I thought back to what happened with me when I was a kid, like, I don't want to be the person that just ignores it. I want to help out as much as I can with all those situations. So that's where I really buckled down and said, you know, this is for me and I'm committed to this. So I'm going to do my best. And um, I had uh, started at the same time as another uh, teacher and we kind of did our uh, new teacher training together and her and I would talk. We became kind of, you know, work friends because we were going to the same school, both, you know, early 20s, first year teachers. And she got the same thing and she quit and never taught again. Wow. Now, she moved back home and I'm never going back in the classroom. Yeah. 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 It, it, it hits people differently. And I think that's when you know you might have something innately in you. Like you're you're seeing it as like, I know that these kids need someone and that right. like, I think too, and not to take away anyone from leaving the classroom at any time in their life and everyone has their own personal reasons, but when kids see a lot of turnover in a school, like I often wonder, and I know it's happening now across the country, but I, I wonder like how they start to view their school and community when they're like, right. all these adults keep leaving and they don't you know, want to be is, here. It, is it us? And you know, yeah. but um, yeah, I, that first year, almost any teacher you talk to, any grade level, you're mm -hmm. going to have funny stories and you're going to have stories where you're like broken down crying or you're just, mm -hmm. that is a load that <laughs> you yeah. received your first year. Um, I was at the, like the other end where I'm 22 years old and the first yeah. year they give me seniors and they basically <laughs> talk to me like I'm their best friend. Right. And like the, the boys want to go out on dates with me and they're dropping off their phone numbers on like the, <laughs> on the desk. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is awful. Like the first year, I'm like, why would you give like a brand yeah. new teacher? And I looked young to begin with. Like mm -hmm. I probably looked like I was 16. Why would right. you give me a senior class? <laughs> but that's what they had right. available. So it's like, you'll take the job. Um, yeah, I know you I, weren't teaching. Oh yeah, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. No, I had a similar experience. I was, when I was going through, I was still in college and I was working um, I was a paraprofessional for SPED in high school. And so I was also like 21, 20, I was about 22, same thing. And, you know, I had another, because we would have like the the regular students come in and help with the SPED students and everything. And it, it was like, we had uh, female students talking to me. I'm like, absolutely not. Goodbye. <laughs> nope, we're not. I'm not even discussing this with you. You got to go. Yeah. yeah. And I would tell my boss, the the SPED director, I'm like, do not, I do not want these people in my classroom. Like, I'm not one of their friends. This, right. It I know like, the, Oh, it yeah. totally is. I was like, I know I look like the cool young guy, but like, I'm not doing this. Like, yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> and so many, I mean, not like, you know, you always, there's that fine line of like anyone right? seeing something like you're being too friendly right? Or how yep. they take it or how they tell their parents something like, you know, it's like serious work with teenagers want to be your friend, especially when you're right. young and they don't know the boundaries, but you have to really like hold that boundary because they yeah. will cross it. They will. Absolutely oh yeah. They're, it. <laughs> yeah. They live. I, I tell everybody that like middle schoolers, high school, they live in the gray area. Mm -hmm. They don't enjoy black and white. They love the gray and they want to <laughs> get you in the gray as quick as possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they don't realize that might get you into trouble. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I had a strong professor tell me the same thing. He, he told everybody, if you're working with older students, you stay black and white. Do not yes. get in the gray area. Like, don't ever let anything slip. Don't even invite one iota of 
um, anything to get in there to where something can happen. Mm -hmm. Just, yeah. And I've seen multiple teachers fired over the years because of something that was serious, like dating Mm -hmm. a student. That was also my first year, same school, first year teaching. First year, there was a whole big like new station at our school because <laughs> there was the guitar teacher was dating and I guess sleeping with like oh a my gosh. year old. I'm like, literally, this is my first year teaching. This is like already <laughs> on, all over the media and everything to other things where your intention was pure and you're being like a good teacher friend, which you shouldn't be. And maybe you yeah. say some things that are crossing the line and then it gets in the parent community and there was another school where I was at where a teacher got fired just for that. Like, again, yeah. didn't do anything. But mm-hmm. if it's taken the wrong way and you get enough parents that are, like, talking about it, like, so, yeah, you really got to watch everything you say yeah. and do. Yeah. It's very clear. Yeah. Um, and elementary is funny because we would have, I had a student. This is a really quick story. Mm-hmm. I had a student, uh, a female teacher come knock on my door in the middle of class. She said, uh, Mr. Foote, can you come help me real quick? I said, yeah. And a male student zipper had got stuck in the bathroom. Oh, no. (laughs) So we're like, okay, all right, we have three adults here watching. I'm fixing a zipper and we're moving on. So, yeah, Yeah. that's that's how you have to. Yeah, in elementary school, you get some of those snafus or like bathroom stuff, (laughs) you know, things that get very intimate. (laughs) Yeah, they're like, you know, they're eight years old. They don't know the difference. They're like, Mr. Fuck, can you zip up my pants? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh my god You're like That's well crazy. hold on let me get another adult first right right yeah, yeah. um i know it's not like the perfect segue but we were i always <laughs> talk about the pandemic but i know you weren't teaching during the pandemic i don't know if you want to talk about maybe your transition first out of the classroom and how you got in the work you're doing now and then maybe how maybe from a parent perspective and and as an outsider now out of the school perspective of looking at the classroom and teaching and you know, all of that during the pandemic. Yeah. So um, uh, we'll get into more like what I do and stuff, I guess, later you said, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'll just, um, I left teaching in 2015. I left education, um, did a couple uh, different like corporate jobs and then got into what I do now in 2018. Um, And so 2020, as far as um, our industry goes, I'll also just talk about as me as a professional now and what I do and how it affected us was um, not as severe as a parent, but it was definitely, we felt it because on our end, you know, we, we rely on the supply chain. Mm. We rely on our manufacturers to get desks and chairs and all the steel and all the wood and everything to these schools when all of a sudden you know, and a lot of our, you know, a lot of the things that we use in the U.S. are imported that um, when that supply chain basically got destroyed um, during the pandemic, 2020 was kind of bad, but not bad yet. Mm-hmm. 21 was an absolute nightmare. Mm-hmm. The summer of 21 doing furniture installations was, I mean, bad across the board. We had, there was no truck drivers at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you remember all of the docks, so especially Long Beach, where most of our imports come in from overseas, was backed up and they had ships sitting out in the ocean for months waiting to get unloaded because there wasn't enough dock workers. And so that affected everything with our schools with, you know, I had some where I had to go get tables from uh, Lowe's, like flip top tables and chairs to make sure they had something to sit on until... Wow this furniture arrived and this was stuff that we had ordered three and a half months ahead of time. Yeah. So I can yeah. say, you know, on our end, that's how it was affected. And then also, you know, uh, it, it wasn't tough on us, let's say financially, but it was tough on us because we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know if we were going to be a company anymore. We didn't yeah. know if we were going to have to find a different revenue stream. Um, and it turned out that, you know, a lot of the schools still, you know, the money was still funded and the way school funding is, you know, it's years ahead of time. So mm-hmm. they kind of knew that and they knew new construction was coming and all that. So we were OK, but it was a very um, worrisome time for our company, um, just mm-hmm. really not knowing what the future is going to hold. Um, personally, uh, it was really hard for us. So I have five kids and they're all in different 
you know, we're, we're spread out. So they're 21, 18, 11 today, and then six-year-old twins. And at the time, you know, we had, we couldn't do preschool for the, for the twins. Mm. And um, our six-year-old was in, or excuse me, our, our son at the time was in second grade. Um, and then our daughter was in high school. And then our son was in just finishing, he was getting ready to finish his first year of college. And he is an engineering student. So he had to come home and he was taking these really hard classes online. And we're still feeling the effects now because he has to do an extra half a year to make up from mm -hmm. COVID because he couldn't take engineering mathematics online, yeah. like via Zoom. It was just too hard. And he's like, dad, I'm smart, but I'm not that I can't do calculus three on a computer or on, I need to be with a professor. So he's having to make those classes up that he couldn't do during the pandemic. But then my daughter loved online school because mm -hmm. she wasn't really like a social butterfly. Or She's like, Oh, this is awesome. I don't have to talk to anybody. <laughs> yeah. I just do my work and I'm done. Um, <clears throat> so she loved it. And then we're still feeling the effects of my younger ones. Um, where my son in first grade, he was just a, I mean, a star in reading just through the roof. Numbers were great, very strong with language arts. And then post pandemic, it's really gone down. And I don't, I'm not blaming the teachers and I'm not blaming us. Like, have we not done anything for them? But I just feel like, it, I, I just feel like the language arts has really, really taken a dive for him since then. Mm -hmm because going, you know, almost a year, year and a half with masks and um, uh, not being in person, I, I think really hurt, really hurt our younger students the most, yeah. especially those, those like sponges who are trying to learn how to read. I can't imagine trying to teach first graders on Zoom like that. No, I couldn't yeah. either. And I know we are doing our best and like our kids are all athletic and everything, but I'm like, what do you do for PE? Like, Stand in front of the computer. I, it was just so confusing for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that that's kind of how how we dealt with it, and um, also having all seven of us in one house too. Personally, was mm. like, you know, there was definitely some times of tension because, you know, you got a cranky, cranky teenage girl and a and a boy who's used to living on his own mm -hmm. to you know a man basically, and and then you know, kids who can't go to preschool and kids who can't go to, you know, wants to be with his friends and do that. So it was, it was, it was tough. Um, we got through it, of course, but um, there were some definitely tough times. Yeah. And in that form, I, I appreciate you sharing about each one of your kids because you have such a range. And so to go <laughs> from like how college was impacting students, I don't think a lot of people think about that. They think, oh, yeah, well, it's college and you're an independent learner anyways, you go mm -hmm. online. But if you're taking a class that is super complicated and you need to work with a person one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. you know, or be able to be in class asking questions, it's still very different on Zoom. Even with your instructor there on Zoom, there the connection was completely lost. And then right. now to have to make up extra time, you know, like, when yeah. you get to that adult age, like you have like kind of a timeline of like when I'm graduating, when I want to start getting a job and like internship <coughs> or whatever that may be. But those formative years too, like we talk to the lower school teachers at my school at the time, but that kindergarten, like first grade, like pre-K to like first grade, any of those grades around the lockdown and like the, you know, through the next year, it was just like, they lost, they lost time with them and they lost mm -hmm. their ability. And it doesn't really, you know, hit on the teachers or parents. It's just their brain. It's just they're developing and they're not mm -hmm. developing properly sitting in front of a computer and not getting right. that human interaction. And so I think eventually, yeah. you know, they'll get caught up, um, but you're going to, yeah, you'll feel it now for like a couple of years. Um, yeah. And some places were closed and virtual for what, a year, year and a half. And then we were in person, but in mass social distance hybrid so like teachers were teaching in person and online at the same time so you're not giving really any attention to any students at all mm -hmm. um yeah it's just really hard so you feel now in like 2023 to things start to feel like there's more momentum in each of your children's like education and their like kind of path right now definitely yeah we we're, we it's it's taken two years but I feel like we're on a good 
we're on a good path on, on their on their um, education and where I think they're going to end up and everything. Um, and something I could say to too, my son was a college fo- or is a college football player, so mm-hmm. it was really hard on him to where he was not even going to play football anymore because mm-hmm. the fall of twenty twenty, he there was no season, no practice, nothing. So they they had to play college football in the spring. So they played college football in like, you know, April and May. And it was um, it was really hard on him because he was like, you know, college football was a scholarship to get in and everything. So he's kind of mm. like, if I quit football, what am I going to do? And he actually thought about he wanted to be, like, you know, he wants to be like a Navy SEAL and going through all these things that he wants to mm. do. And so it was it was tough uh, mentally on him, too. And there's a lot of athletes that didn't go back. Mm. That like I'm not going to you know, realize was kinda, that. that was all I really did. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't even think about that because that makes so much sense. But particularly if you're on a scholarship, it's like what mm-hmm. happens to that scholarship if there isn't the sport available for that season? Yeah, you still get to keep it, and the schools honored it. But right, a lot of the kids like football was their is their life, and if they're not playing football, they're getting in trouble or they're not keeping up their grades or yeah you know that th- there was a lot of kids that, or they just lost interest and like you know yeah. what like I don't want to have to do all this zoom stuff for college like I'm just going to go do something else and there's quite oh, a bit of kids that sense. yeah yeah when my son came back that he said a lot of kids like on our team there's some that didn't show back up wow yeah I didn't even think about that at all that's yeah. just really but I'm so grateful to hear that your your kids are doing great and like your your son too and he was able to you know finish up with um his degree that's amazing in engineering too <laughs> I'm sure you're Thank so you. proud yeah yeah he'll be done in December so wow. we're we're really excited so getting yeah. into my last part and maybe that also kind of segue into the work you're doing mm-hmm. now I was asked teachers, uh, whether they're currently or former teachers, what do you see in education today and what we need to improve upon? And what do you mm-hmm. see in like making those changes in education? And maybe that's some of the work that you're doing within your your position now. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll speak from kind of like a broad lens um, as a parent and a former educator and, and you know, just somebody looking um you know, looking in from the outside is I, I I put some notes and bullet points here and what things that I've always said. And um, when I was doing my master's program uh, back in 2009, <clears throat> um, I was, a, I got my educational administrator certificate, you know, because I thought I wanted to be a principal and all that and, and do it forever. And uh, I decided not to, but when I was doing it, they made us do a, um, create your own like core values, creed type of thing. And, you know, the, our, our professor was like, you know, you're going to keep this on your desk for the rest of your life. Like, and this is what you should stick to. And, you know, one of the things um, I said on there was actually very controversial and there there's context to it. So when I say it, let me finish it <laughs> mm-hmm. um, was I said, one of the first things I said was, I said, throwing money at education is not the answer. Mm-hmm. And everybody in the room was like, <gasps> like an audible gasp from everybody in our, in our, in my cohort at, at Grand Canyon University. And I, <clears throat> so I think that money by itself is just not the answer that do schools need to be funded better? Absolutely. Do teachers need to be paid more? A hundred percent. But I just feel like it's too much of a blanket statement when people say what's wrong with education. It's like, they need more money and like, well, let's get deeper with that. Like, where does the money go? How much is being used? Where's the waste? Um, Because we know that in private school, it can, money can be wasted uh, or excuse me, in public school, it can be wasted Um, in any public organization. It can. And so I think that they do need to be funded, but they need to be funded properly. Um, and I don't want to just give a blanket statement of saying, we just have to throw more money at education and it's going to fix it. Mm. You know, it's a proponent of it, but it's not the main thing. Um, and I've always said that education starts at home Mm. and, uh, 
we have, you know, we have our children for more of the day. You know, of course they have them for like the six to eight hours, but we provide that first imprint with them. Um, and we're an extension of that classroom. So I feel like, are we sending them off, putting them on the best foot in the morning? Um, what type of foundation are we giving them? And so I th really think it starts at home first. Um, and something I, I love to, I love to talk about is bringing class sizes down. Mm -hmm. Um, my first year teaching I had 32 kids. Yeah. And for third grade. For third yeah. grade, I felt like I was herding cattle. It was like, and with all just, those different needs that you had. Yeah. Yeah. It was tough. So, yeah. and, and then there was a, there was a time where I, I had like 24 and it was such a huge difference. I was like, gosh, why? <laughs> I was like, it, 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 I was like, I have so much more time to, to get in individualized instruction and, and differentiate and, and um, fulfill more needs. So I feel like class size is definitely um, do need to come down. And I think legally they should have a cap on them. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's a great point. Yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and this is something I, I, I'm very, I feel very, very strongly about is uh, I believe in mastery, not grades. Um, mm -hmm. I, I honestly don't care about grades all that much. They don't mean that much to me. If my students are straight A students, I'm very proud of them. I'm very excited. If they get C's, I'm like, that's just based on your effort. That's all it is. It's not your ability at all. Um, I want to see mastery. And I feel like if you don't master something, you can't, you know, you need to keep doing it until it's mastered before you can go on. Um, there's a, uh, kind of a famous administrator, a quasi famous Arizona administrator here. His name's Sidney, or it goes by Sid, Sid Bailey. And he was a inner city Phoenix principal for a long time. And he was on the news for his program that he kind of originated here. And it was all based on that, that you cannot move on to the next concept until you're at 80%, which is mastery, um, according to Arizona state standards. So you, you, you cannot, there's no social promotion, none of that. You cannot move on until you're at 80% mm. of the concept. Um, and it had glowing results and I wish, you know, uh, more, more people stuck with it. Um, just cause I think, I think grades are really just effort. They're yeah, not, it really is. Yeah. It really is. And, um, you know, I, was, I coached a baseball player. And he was a, a and B student all the time because his parents were like, get home, do your homework, pounding on him, checking his work, you know, never missed an assignment, always A's and B's. And then he took his ACTs and he's like, oh my gosh, I scored so low. Mm. I was like, yeah, cause that's not effort. Like, like that's just aptitude. That's all it is. So, mm -hmm. um, um, I feel like that's one. And then I think, um, I really worry about the, you know, the, something I was reading about is the, the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know, you're, you're, you're in Philly and, you know, you've mm -hmm. seen it probably uh, more than I have here, but uh, there was an interesting study that says like, uh, um, they look at reading levels or reading mastery of students to determine how many prison beds are going to be needed in so many years. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And if <laughs> If you think about, I mean, I, I'll go to elementary school here for, I'll go, I'll go to third grade. And this is not an epiphany, but I was sitting around going, isn't it weird how the students with the worst behavior are also the worst performing? Mm. You know, it's very rare that it's a student who excels, can't control himself or herself. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, uh, it, it, and it's scary because again, that most of that starts at home and having that foundation. So I feel like on that front, you know, more money will help decrease that class size. Um, and I feel like, uh, I think I put in our notes that I feel like teachers need to be in student teaching a lot longer. They need, oh, for they, sure. they need more training. Um, and I feel like we can go back to the college of ed and even start teaching what we do as a company now, K-12, 
and learning environments. Because when I think about my college of ed, we didn't talk anything about. No, we didn't either. No, and I, I mean, we're probably about the same age. So I think, yeah. you know, you're, you could say the same thing. I feel like that would be, that would be a huge help. Um, <clears throat> and uh, um, a more rigorous college of education, making it a lot tougher to get through. Um, but in turn, if we do that, we got to pay more money because yeah, look, look where I'm at now. And it's strictly because, uh, you know, I loved what I did, but my wife was pregnant with twins mm -hmm. and she's like, we can't do this anymore. Like, you yeah. know, you got to find something else. Yeah. And for sure, like, you know, the teacher salary, like you said, I love this idea of it's not just about throw more money at education. It's what you do with it. And there's so much waste in like any kind of bureaucracy, but Mm -hmm. a lot of waste in public education i'm sure even at the independent level mm -hmm. but um yeah if you don't make teaching really competitive and salary is part of that then you are going to have people walk and leave because they're like i have to support a family and i'm seeing people mm -hmm. in all these other industries that don't have advanced degrees and they're making way more money than me because also what's right. required for teachers is to go and get a master's degree and continue learning because part of your job is to be a learner so, but that also costs money it costs time and then you're not getting paid that much extra for it I mean even right. the increase from bachelor's to master's degree it's not a huge salary increase no uh, pay 50,000 for a, yeah pay 50,000 for a master's to make a couple thousand dollars more a year I'm not seeing no. the math <laughs> no not at all yeah. um I 100% agree about classroom size and there should be a cap. There should probably be a cap around like 20, 25, you know, maximum. Uh, 25 times. Uh, and like elementary, you know, maybe even like, again, keep that at 20. Cause I taught a class in Hawaii when I was in the public school system and it was 36 students. Ooh. And the one class that was 36 students was the ESL, mm -hmm. all these students with IEPs. I mm -hmm. had a student who had a life coach with him. And that was the class that had 36 students. I'm like, so the most right. challenging class with the kids with all the needs, you're going to pack them in because the gifted class only had like 18 or 20 because those are yeah. the kids who tested into it. So who gets dumped all into like yeah. one class instead of saying, well, how can we make this maybe into two separate classes? Like there should be an ESL social studies and I'm working with an ESL teacher alongside and team right. teaching with me. Yeah. So they have to be smaller. Right. And, and you think about those classes, when you would watch those gifted classes, what were they doing? They were doing project based learning. They were getting outside They're you know, making doing gardens and all yeah. kinds of and what you're in survival mode. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> yeah, like, totally. I have kids, yeah. Like I have kids that don't have clothes to wear to school today. Like, I mean, yeah. it's yeah. <laughs> it's so scary. And um I also, you know, when you're talking about that, I want to talk like when you look at that, the gifted programs, a lot of that is project based learning. Mm -hmm. And why is that not in in regular? Why is that not in the in the standard? Uh, yeah, that actually would standard. benefit the students in those other classes more so because they're right? working with their hands. They're working with mm -hmm. maybe being engaged with something they're going to do for their community. And they're really yeah. buying in and they're interested instead of being bored sitting there, because a lot of times we think that the students might not just be there academically. They could just be bored, you know? Right. And that kind of goes mm -hmm. back into like classroom design as well. Like if you have a, you know, a boring class that's not inspiring or you have a setup that's just the generic rows and it's all about control and I'm your teacher and I'm just telling you what to do. They're going to be like, I'm not listening to you. This is boring. You know, like right. I don't feel any buy-in in this classroom. So I don't know if um kind of into like, the work you do now in um, yeah. K-12, if you want to talk about that, because I think it's really interesting and something that mm -hmm. hasn't been brought up on this show yet. Perfect. Well, that's a great segue. Yeah. So um, just a little more brief history on K-12. So we do, you know, our main source of revenue and what we do is, is school furniture for sure. But we're different than a, let's say a traditional furniture sales company in that you know, we just go around and we respond to bids and we put furniture in classrooms and, and call it a day. We get <clears throat> real deep into the needs of the school, but also the community um, within that district and that school. 
Um, we like to work 12 to 18 months ahead of time with the architect, with the general contractor, with the designers and the school district. And we talk about, okay, what's your district's master plan? What's the vision for that school? Um, are you guys one-to-one? -one? Um, what's the neighborhood like? Is this school going to be used for something else other than just school? Because in low-income neighborhoods, usually that school is like the beacon of hope for the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they use it for a health clinic. We have schools that the multi-purpose room doubles as like a, a, a junior college classroom at night for parents. Mm. Um, you know, kids, kids and parents are there a lot because they provide two to three meals a day for them, things like that. So mm -hmm. we ask a lot of those questions. Um, and we design spaces based off of those needs. Um, and I feel like what we're trying to do is we're trying to create um a learner driven environment, a learner centered mm -hmm. environment, if you will, where we get out of the idea of that teacher saying, this is, sorry, my computer shakes when I move here, sorry, um, where the teacher says, this is my room and now it's our room. And we do that by trying to eliminate the giant L desk in the classroom where the teacher can, you know, sit out all day and hand out packets. Mm -hmm. Like the, those days have to be long gone because those jobs just aren't there anymore. We're not creating assembly line workers. Right. Um, and we have to be able to diversify our teaching styles for the diverse learning styles of students. I bet you and I don't learn the same, Jackie. And I can, you could probably ask 10 people right now and every, you'll probably get five different responses of where everybody's at with those like, I'm a front middle guy. And then you'll talk to people like, I'm an introvert. I want to be in the back by myself. And I learned just fine like that. And um, what we try and do is we try and create learning environments where there's no front of the room. There's no back of the room. Mm. There's not one teaching wall. Um, every space is a learning space. It's not stand and deliver front of the room stage, uh, sage on a stage. I have a screen, I got two whiteboards, and here's my room. Everybody follow what I'm doing here. It's no, 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 this is our room. Um, you know, Jackie, you, you may sit in this desk on Monday, but on Tuesday, you may be over here sitting on the floor, sitting up high at like a cafe table. Um, you know, if we do have to do a lecture style uh, room, we do stadium seating where the back row sits up higher than the front row. And, and it just makes it so, especially for like middle and high school kids are like, oh, this kind of feels like a college lecture hall. Yeah. You know, and if you treat them like adults, you know, more times than not, they're going to want to act like it. Mm -hmm. If you treat, if you treat middle school kids like babies, they will, they will 100% play that up and act like they're helpless. Mm -hmm. So um, we try and create spaces that bring out everybody's learning styles. Um, and what we do as a company is we're just way more involved with what's going to go in those classrooms rather than just, Hey, we need a thousand desks and a thousand chairs that's cheap as possible. How can we pull that off? You know, that's the complete opposite of how we operate. Yeah. Um, and, you know, leaving, leaving education was really, really hard for me. Um, and I actually, you know, my, my two older kids, came to school with me every day from 2005 until 2015. So for 10 years, my kids came to school with me every day. And I, my oldest son had gone to high school, so I didn't have him anymore. But I had to leave my sixth grade daughter at the school that I was leaving from. And it was the one, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. She was really, really upset. Yeah. And she'd always gone to school with her dad. And, you know, I was like her security blanket. So it was really hard. And, um, so when I left and then <clears throat> I took kind of a corporate job and I'll just tell you, I went from being, you know, like a, a you know, a really well-respected teacher on campus, I like to say, and I always, I felt like I knew the answers and I could help other teachers and um, I felt pretty seasoned and in it. And I, I felt like I could always give a helping hand and I was 
liked by the kids and the parents. I'm sure some people didn't like me, but just the way the world works. <laughs> um, to working in a cubicle. Mm. And I'm like, very Man, different. <laughs> I can't. I, I did it for two years. And I was like, I cannot do this anymore. I cannot. Yeah. Yeah. And so I took a chance on um, another job and not this one. And it was in the furniture industry. And I, my wife and I talked about it. She's like, you know what? I believe in you. And I was betting on myself. And I was like, I think I can do this. Landed it. And then um, our owner, he's a visionary, Kevin Stoller, um, uh, pulled me over. And it's been awesome ever since because it's like, long story short, is I can affect the classroom mm -hmm. in different ways now. And I can affect education. And I can go in and make a difference. And I, at first it was like, for me, at first it was just furniture sales. I didn't know. And then the more I get into it, the more I got to see the reaction of the schools and the kids when they saw their stuff, it made it oh, all wow. worthwhile of like, yeah. yes, I'm, I'm not in here every day. I'm not, you know, Mr. Foot anymore. I'm not like, you know, help, but I'm still affecting kids' lives in some way. And so that's why like, um, financially it works out better, but also, emotionally i'm still very very much invested into what i do um i do not i 100 percent do not do this for the money mm. i do it because i honestly want to see education change i want to see it flipped on its head mm -hmm. um and uh, you know there's a reason why homeschooling is i wish i had the data in front of me i apologize but it, i mean it's probably gone up what it's blowing 30 yeah. percent i mean yeah. it's yeah yeah um, yeah. there's a lot of parents who are like, I never thought I could homeschool my kid, but I can't do it anymore. I'm going to homeschool my kid. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, you know, what I do. And I'll give you a quick little story if you don't mind about, sure. um, what this job means to me and what we do and how it affects, um, their lives. And I got to share this with our whole company and team. We were all in Arizona here a couple of weeks ago doing like our team meetings and trainings. We do it once a year because we all kind of work remote across the nation. So we had people coming in from Philly, from the Carolinas, um, a bunch from Ohio, me in Arizona, Colorado, Texas. So everybody came in. And so because of, you know, this is technically my state, I took them to the schools that I've done. And I took them to a district here in a very underserved community, we'll say, um, in South Phoenix that um, is one of the poorest areas in Arizona. Um, and they, I took them to a school where we did an amazing, amazing program. We're still working on it. It's for the ASU Spark program. And it's a K-3 school that where kids actually rotate and they're, you know, like kindergartens or first graders will, um, will intermingle. So you could have K-1 in a classroom for reading and K-1 in another classroom for reading just kind of based on abilities and everything. Mm -hmm. And so they do a lot of transitions and rotations. So I went and interviewed the school. I went and watched and I sat out there with a timer and watch kids transition. You know, they wave at me going through with their little boxes and their stuff. And I watched them. And I, at the end, I was like, you guys are losing a lot of minutes on this. Mm -hmm. I go, just today I counted this. Like imagine that times 180. You're losing all that, you know, here's how yeah. we need to make it. So Got with the architect. Here's how we redid it. Here's the furniture. Here's how we can make it so their transitions are easier, so on and so forth. <clears throat> so like always, I go check on the install to make sure everything's going well. My installers are good. Everything's clean, built, you know, get sign offs. And I went over there and got it all done. And then I went back to check on something and the students were moving their stuff in because this is a, a project that's going simultaneously with school being enrolled at the same time. And um, so they got to move into their classrooms. And so they were bringing their little uh, boxes and everything. And I watched them coming through and getting into their room. And I was like, it, I watched it from the side and I said, I've cried twice at my job. And that was one of them where I started tearing up Aww. watching these little first kindergarten to first graders carry their stuff. And then, when they opened the door with the things they were saying, they were so excited oh, because wow. they, they came from a school that was built in the seventies. Mm. Um, and the classrooms hadn't been touched since then. Wow. And wow. they went to the most beautiful spaces, to stuff they've never seen, to tables you can write on. They were yes. like, oh, 
she could write on the table and so yeah playful yeah. it's imaginary you know like oh yeah see that spark of kids I'm sure even in if you did that with a space for high school they'd they'd be lighting up like little kids again just to right? see something so different and yeah. innovative because any kind of spaces I've gone into that were very different as a mm -hmm. teacher I'm like oh my gosh I want to teach in this room I want to be in this <laughs> room with, with well, kids yeah in, in one of our presentations that we do for like districts and and um and architects is you know, the, they said four out of five teachers, when you ask them, they said that their learning environment greatly affects, um, greatly affects how they feel about every, about the school, like where, mm -hmm. how they're, you know, how much is invested in, in, in their, in their learning environment. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I feel like even more now teacher retention you know, we got to give them all the tools. It's like, mm -hmm. first off, we're not paying them enough. Then we're going to give them 36 kids. And then we're going to give them old, excuse my language, crappy furniture. <laughs> yeah. Building falling <laughs> down. Probably Have not fun. sound by code. Yeah. You know? Don't quit. Have fun. Don't quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sending um, the wrong message. Like, yeah, don't you yeah. stay in for 40 years, right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, uh, if you ever get time, look up this, look up a high school in Arizona called Canyon View High School. Okay. Um, very innovative, beautiful school. It's won many, many awards for architecture and design. Mm -hmm. And um, and then another in elementary called John McCain Elementary School. Um, I think I've heard of that man. Yeah. <laughs> You've heard of John McCain, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Um. And so John McCain was my school that I, I helped design inside and out with the architect of the district. Canyon View, I did not, but I love what they do and what they did. And what they have is they have, teachers really own no real estate. The only spaces you have are like a centralized space where you can come in and grade papers and mm -hmm. answer emails and do all your stuff during your prep hours. There's no prep hour in a classroom. And so like Jackie, if you're teaching, you know, senior English, you are not in room B101. Like you may be there on Monday, Mondays and Wednesdays, but Tuesday and Thursday, you're on the first floor in a different style room. Mm -hmm. um, or you may be teaching in an open air classroom, half inside, half indoors, half outdoors. Um, and you go to these classrooms, they're all storefront, all glass on the front. And those doors open all the way up. They fold like an accordion. And then also you'll see those doors closed and they're writing on dry erase on the glass. That's so cool. Wow. It's another teaching wall. Or you'll see kids doing it. And I'm like, that. that's what I love to see. That's innovative. It's yeah. very and innovative. It's, also, it's a top-down thing there too, where the principal and the district 100% supports this. They, they fight for it and they hold all their teachers accountable. Um, it's not... Hey, here's your beautiful stuff. Go figure out how to teach in it. Mm -hmm. They really put a lot of PD into it. And that's, oh, that's something wonderful. That's what I was going to ask too. Like, you know, yeah. you have these innovative spaces, but then giving teachers the tools of like, how do you fully utilize that space? Yeah. And, and without being salesy here, that's something we do as K-12 that I feel like sets us apart is we will go in post installation, post occupancy and help give PD to teachers that are worried about um, teaching in spaces where I've always had 30 desks in a row and 30 chairs, mm -hmm. or I've had the big heavy combo sled desk. And I've, I've never had kids sit on the floor. Mm -hmm. I've never had kids stand while I teach. Mm -hmm. What do I do? Yeah. Um, and we make it so like, you know, I don't know, Jackie, if you ever had to deal with this or what's the furniture in your room now or before, but if you're like, hey, let's get into groups, mm. how long does it take you to get into groups? Oh, or for sure. Teachers? A long time. Yeah. Because they're, oh. they're heavy too. The desk yeah. are heavy. Yeah. No, we're doing furniture where it's like, but you can be, you can be, this is something you'll go through the first week, just like all your, your norms and practices of, you know, let's say third grade where walking in line to PE. Keep, you know, keep the bubble in your mouth, no talking and all the fun things we used to do. Something we could do is we show this as a lesson plan was during that week, we show them, hey, okay, we teach them what grouping 
A or whatever you want to call it, T-Rex or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Grouping A is these four here, these four, and you move them all around. And then later on in the year, you can tell kids, okay, guys, get in grouping A. You have 90 seconds. They can move their desks and their furniture in 90 seconds, get into grouping A. Mm -hmm. And they know where to go. Something like that. And, and all of those learners are diverse and they're getting to see um, creating empathy for them as well by getting to see that like, hey, I can help out this kid that's struggling mm. and I'm not always the high flyer in the high flyer group or the other kid that's like, I'm not always the low kid in the low group. And it really creates a, a way for kids to be empathetic for other people's learning styles. Yeah. I feel like even as teachers, if you're given a classroom of 30 desks and 30 chairs, you're like, I'm going to teach to the middle. And I'm going right. to teach to average and hopefully, you know, and, and some kids aren't going to make it. And some kids are going to be bored because it's too easy. And mm -hmm. I'm just going to teach in the middle. But if you have those learning environments, it almost forces you to be like, it does. Yeah. I got to change this up. Mm -hmm. I really do. Um, it influences and, the teaching. Those environments. Yeah and, yeah. and to be honest, Jackie, sometimes it's a tough sell on, Somebody who's been teaching like that forever, right. you know? Right. It's so different. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I had a, um, I had a course where somebody said, you know, it's like, Kevin, you started teaching in the early 2000s. You were trained by somebody who started teaching in the eighties. Mm -hmm. They were trained by somebody who started teaching in the sixties. Right. I bet nothing's different. From that. Right. It just keeps getting passed <laughs> yeah. down. It's the same. That's why everything has stayed status quo. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, they're like, I bet the only thing is different is you don't have to run your attendance to the office. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just like, yeah, all the functions of computers and like, you know, yeah. learning systems. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I, I could honestly sit and talk about this all day, but yeah. I that, love that's, it. It's so exciting. Yeah. So that's, that's really what we do is at K-12 and um, as a company, we're just, we have such amazing people that, that work with me. Um and like I said, Kevin Stoller, our owner, he he does uh, the Better Learning podcasts, okay. and he has really, really high level conversations on there. From it's not necessarily just built environment. He has architects, he has superintendents, he has um, former teachers. He's got everybody on that podcast. Anybody who wants to shape, um, anybody who wants to shape education. And, and or reshape education to, to fit our current to fit our current status is he loves to have on and mm, um that. he actually wrote a book called um you know creating better learning environments which is you know kind of like a tagline of our company um and he he has some pretty amazing stories of going into classrooms and seeing these things and and that you know everybody has a light bulb moment yeah you know I became a teacher because my light bulb moment was like, I want to be like Rich Hogan. And so everybody has a light bulb moment. So. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, that's a great way to end it too. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank where you. can our listeners find you or learn more about K-12? Um, we can plug any information I'll put in the show notes and I'm going to be going out there and looking up more about these schools that you mentioned too, because I'd love to yeah. see some of these learning environments. For sure. So you can, our website's um, an awesome, uh, we have a lot of our projects on there and you can click on my name or any of my uh, coworkers' names and see some of their past projects, but it's just k12.com. And it's a little different. Don't go to k12.com because that's like a, an education site that's been there for 30 years. Um, it's uh, kay-twelve.com and do all that. Yeah. I would give out my phone number, just text me. I'll talk about it all day. <laughs> And I'll plug, um, I'll share your LinkedIn information and all of that. Yeah, for sure. Website. Yeah. Anybody that wants to talk about it or learn more again, you know, we're nationwide. So mm -hmm. if it's somewhere I can get to, um, uh, we can be there. And I know you said you're outside of Philly, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So one of my coworkers, uh, Bob is there. And, um, you know, if you ever want to go see some of the things he's done, yeah, I could point you away. Yeah. And okay. if you're ever, you know, in this side of the world, I'd, I'd give you a tour of campuses anytime so oh great thank you so much well thank you for being on the show and i loved hearing what your story and all this innovative work um in education in the classroom it's really really different it's awesome work thank you thank you jackie i really appreciate you inviting me on i had a lot of fun
Great. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.